Balance your trading strategy by adding futures. CME Group helps you manage risk and capture opportunities in all market environments. Capitalize on around-the-clock access to highly liquid global futures and options market across all major asset classes. Just visit your online broker and get started. Plug into valuable educational materials and trading tools and see what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com slash on the tape. So typically I start this with banter, you know, it's some bullshit I say, but today I'm getting right into it. You're listening to On The Tape. I'm Guy Adami, you know the voice, joined as always by Dan Nathan and the very sexy Danny Moses. But today we are joined by Danny's big short colleagues. Notice I didn't say big chill, I'm keeping it IRL as they say or whatever. Vinny Daniels here with us in studio and Porter Collins from Parts Unknown. We're going to get into it because a lot's happened Vinny, since your January 14th appearance on On The Tape, the world is going a little haywire here. And we're just going to sort of put it out there. This is going to be, what do they call it, Dan, when you just riff? You just call it riffing. Riffing. Thank you very much. Vinny, how are you, man? I'm pretty good. How are you doing? I'm thrilled that you're here in real life. It's good to see you live. It is. And we hugged it out before, just in case folks were wondering, because you know I'm a huge Yankee fan. Vinny's a huge Met fan. But we gave it. first thing I did, I walked in, we gave a big hug. Vinny, what's going on? I think we think remarkably the same. A lot's happened in the last, you know, two and a half, three months. Listen, central banks run amok. Well, this is the flip side of central banks run amok. Sort of walk us through what you've been seeing. So first off, thanks for having us. And I love doing this live. After we left the last time, I said, I'm not doing this until we're all together. And I got to tell you, Guy, you're a handsome man. I am. I appreciate that. And Thank I, you, I'm a little jealous because I think you could actually get one of the roles in Goodfellas over me. Well, you know what's funny about that? I think we both could be in it. We'd play different roles. Yeah, he'd play your son. Porter, we got these stallions going at each other right now. I wish you were here. To- I'm just the wannabe Italian part of this. Uh- so I was laughing at myself. I was like, I listen to them every week. And lately, it's had a very bearish tone. Guys have been using the word constructive a lot. And even Danny, he thought he was being constructive, which was hilarious. And I was like, I'm going to try and be constructive. And I think towards the end, we will. But I don't want to turn this into a bear festival. But in the near term, shit's bad. We all know the data points. We have war. We have inflation. We have food, oil, Peru. Everything's going on. But let's try and keep it simple. And I was talking to a friend today about this. It's like, for the past 13 years... We've been taught, all of us have been taught, don't fight the Fed. That's all I hear. Don't fight the Fed, buy the dip. Well, let's keep it simple. Don't fight the Fed. I don't know how many Fed members have to come on and tell us not to buy equities. How many more times do they have to come out and saying, we're going to accelerate QT. We're going to go 200 basis points. We're going to do 50 bit hikes. We're gonna... They're telling you, we want this market to go down because the priority is inflation. So you know what? I'm going to listen to them. I'm not going to fight the Fed. And I would suggest to other people, there could be contra trades here and there, up, I get it. But I think in general, the trend, sadly, I don't know for how long, is down. So Porter, Vinny just said the Fed is telling you to sell stocks, that they're trying to work the stock market lower. Are you in that same camp? Because to me, I feel like I don't see the upside of them talking the market down. I understand what they're trying to do as it relates to inflation. Do you put the two together as far as we know that one of their main things that they do is jawbone, but do you think it's really directed at the stock market or more so just inflation? I think it's directed exactly at inflation. I mean, they're trying to jawbone inflation down. But the only problem is, is that the only way they can do it is destroy demand. And that's not good for anything. And so while you guys are bearish, I'm looking at a $1,933 gold, $100 oil, $6 natural gas, $63 uranium, coals ripping. I'm a full on commodity investor these days. I don't know what you guys are so bearish about. The world's fantastic. You moved to Planet Houston and that changed. Let me just say that I would take Vinny's comment, which I know is- There's a bull market somewhere, Danny. Anywhere, you know? Listen, Tongue in cheek, what Vinny said, they want you to basically tell you to sell the market. I think what they're doing is they're using the market as cover. Because the market's not down enough relative to what they should be doing, they're coming out now full hawk. You're thinking this is our opportunity to really lay the groundwork for this. And they have. They have built the market expectations now for several rate hikes for 50 bips in May and 50 bips in June. And I'll say again, 
I don't think the market knows what to do with 50 bips in May and 50 bips June, but good on them for just getting it out there into the market. Now it's up to the investors to decide where they want to go. Right. And I was just trying to drill down a little bit, Vinny, because maybe you were just saying it that way. I'm just curious. Under a lot of scenarios, if the stock market never goes and retests those lows from just a few weeks ago and the Fed's able to do what they want to do with QT and obviously raising rates the way and the speed or velocity in which they want to do it, then that's probably a pretty good outcome, all things being equal. True. But you have to keep in mind that the Fed's magic works in legs. And so I'm looking at some of the leading indicators. And I'm a little bit different than others in saying, I think the leading, leading indicator of all is interest rates. I know that sounds odd. But what I mean by it is it's, we're a finance-based economy. And we buy everything on leverage. So when you see mortgage rates go up as much as they do, that is eventually going to lead to a slowdown in the U.S. economy. It just is what it is. And look, I truly believe the Fed does not want to do anything. And they're trying the jawbone tactic. But what if it doesn't work? What if you're right? Rates stay high and the equity markets keep going up and inflation remains stubborn at 5 or 6%. Then they have to move. They have to do things. So either the jawbone works or they're actually going to start to apply tightening measures. That's the way I see it. So when I think about it and getting back to what Porter said, yeah, we are long energy. We are long commodities. We are long uranium, stuff like that. But when you talk about overall markets, what impacts the indices... And that's what I was talking about. I just don't see how you can buy this market right now. Let me dumb it down a little bit. So when we were at Front Point and we were going through the housing crisis, looking at the data, there was a period of time where the data was clear to everybody. The people being impacted in real life by the crisis were getting hit already. They had arms they couldn't reset. They were losing their homes. It was actually already beginning. What's really interesting is the myopic view, I think, that portfolio managers have in New York and Boston and what affects them. It didn't hit New York and Greenwich until a lot later when you think about a property. Same with inflation. The people that are fighting the higher costs right now in the economy aren't invested in the stock market. Those are people that are buying food, people that are getting gas. And for some reason, what should be so obvious to the input of what you're looking at, and Vinny, what you're saying is if you input interest rates into various models, everything changes. If your cost of debt changes, what you're paying in interest changes. That means your cash flow is less. All these things, it's an unvirtuous cycle on the way out, and it's been a virtuous cycle. And I'm the person at this table, certainly including if Porter was here, the most guilty of trying to fight the Fed from 2009 on. I am a fundamental investor at heart. I always will be. I want to change. And it crushed me because one, you want to believe that the work that you do on companies matters. You want to believe, but guess what? We're here now. Now it's time. And again, I'll say it again. There's longs, there's shorts. There's always going to be buys in the market. I don't want to always be bearish, but the evidence, it's just so simple. And let me just say this. When the Fed minutes came out yesterday, I started thinking about what was going on actually in that Fed room. And I started thinking about the movie, The Titanic, where the guys that are playing the bass and the cello and the violin on the deck, the last thing they said to each other was, gentlemen, it's been a privilege playing with you tonight. And then the ship sank. They also said, what's the use? Nobody's listening to us anyway. In that, Those are the two quotes that I think, and I think of the Fed governors as those people right now, because that's what's happening right now. But it's right in front of us, everybody. So they're the biggest buyer of assets in the world, and now they're not. And that's it. It's interesting. They also said, let's play because at least it'll keep us warm. Maybe that's what we're doing here. We're just trying to keep each other warm. I'll hug you, by the way, Dan, if you want. But listen, David Rosenberg, we talk about Rosie all the time, put out a tweet earlier this week. Vinny, this is for you because I think this speaks to exactly what you just said. You don't need the yield curve to know a recession is imminent. The home builders, home furnishings, by the way, look at Restoration Hardware recently, Auto parts and specialty retail stocks collectively are in a deep bear market. And that is a near perfect signal right there. As a portfolio manager, someone who invests, I always laugh at the certainties that people speak about. We deal in probability, but he's right. The probability right now is sitting that we are going to have, at the very least, an economic slowdown of some kind. We're seeing it already. And there was some trucking in the seas that are telling you that the leading indicators are headed down. So to me, we have to brace for that. And typically, or at least in the past, the Fed had your back the minute something went down. And you guys have spoke about this, and I got it from you. The executive, Powell's boss, a few years ago, he was telling him, I want the stock market higher. So he loosened. Now the mandate is get inflation down. So they cannot loosen right now. And we have spoke about it the last time. Nothing has really changed. That makes me pause to buy typically what index-related stocks. That's the way I think about it. So, Porter, though, if there's going to be a meaningful slowdown, we're talking about recessions and stuff, and I'm not an economist. I say it all the time. 
I'm not smart enough or humorless enough to be one. But if there is this slowdown, how do you reconcile being long commodities with what we just talked about for the last few minutes? It's an excellent point and something we've been talking about for a while. If you look at the underlying supply-demand dynamics, of probably the easiest one right now is uranium in nuclear power plants. They produce about 150 million pounds a year and demands 190 million pounds. And so you have these huge imbalances across multiple commodity sectors, which we just haven't invested in in a long time. I think peak capex in energy or in oil and gas was in 2012. And meanwhile, we go crazy about we found the 30th payment company to improve the speed of our checkout at XYZ website. And we've invested poorly in energy for a long time. Europe spent $1.5 trillion on wind and solar. Well, if they had done the same in nuclear, we wouldn't have had this problem at all right now. Probably wouldn't even have been a war. But I do worry about the slowdown with regard to oil prices and some stuff like that. People still are on factoring that the Russian oil still is not out of the market yet. That's a whole other topic. But I just think there's a huge supply demand imbalance in these commodities. And if you're bullish, well, then oil is going higher. If you're not as bearish as we are and you think the economy is going to clip along just fine and maybe have a wobble here and there, well, then oil prices are going to be much higher than where they are. Let me just say on the Rosenberg comment. I'm a big Rosie fan. He was crucial to us in the housing crisis. He was a great economist, great strategist. He's been dead wrong on inflation, okay? His call has been transitory. It's been no inflation. He can go make the call now that things are slowing down. Well, hold on, though. Do you guys really think, though, if the situation in Russia did not invade Ukraine, that we'd be talking about 9% yes. CPI? Really? We were already there. We haven't even started to begin to see the impact. It's now. We're going to start to see it in the March data that we're going to get out in April on all this stuff, looking back. My point is this. It was never transitory because of wages. That's what I believe. If Rosenberg wants to make the comment that we're in recession, I'm not going to disagree. We're going there. I'm not going to disagree with that. But what is causing the recession is not the Fed yet. They're going to induce it and make it even worse. My point is you can't have it both ways. The second thing is that people look at the 210. We've talked about this already. Oh, the 210 is no longer inverted. It's back to 16 bips. Oh, there's no recession. Stop using the spread to tell you where things are going to be. And by the way, is it healthy, everybody, for the two-year to move 15, 17 basis point intraday? What are we doing? The 10-year to move 15, 20 intraday? This is outrageous in terms of the volatility in the most liquid asset in the world. <laughs> now you got me all riled up. And Porter, my question, my long-winded question to you is, and I think you said it, you nailed it. If oil goes down from here, it's because the economy is slowing. Use oil as the indicator for what the economy is going to do. Stop with the 210 spread. Porter, agree? Yeah. The other point I would touch on here is that most people are trained to, in most recent times, been trained to be second derivative investors. Oh, the inflation is slowing. Well, it's going to slow at some point. But I think that we pride ourselves on being absolute investors and saying, hey, who cares if it's slowing? It's still 9% CPI. And I'm a big believer in the shadow stats. So the real inflation is a lot higher than 9%. And so I just think that this level of debt and the 10 year doing what it's doing scares me the most. Just knowing how levered we are and how much debt the U.S. government has. We all agree that the consumer and corporate debt has been placed on the sovereign. And to see rates doing what it's doing. And I don't know if it's because other countries are pulling out because of some of the sanctions or it's QT. Whatever it is, it's concerning. And that's what scares me the most. When rates go up and inflation goes up, PEs historically have gone down. And that's what I expect. The other thing is, is that so tech heavy weighted, tech uses adjusted earnings, not real gap earnings. This market is just so expensive right now. And there's a huge bifurcation between some of the consumer stocks, which have been crushed. Some of these stocks are single digit five, three, six PE stocks, whereas these big behemoths are still at all time high PEs are close to them. So I think there's a real stock pickers market. And you say this all the time, but the ETFs have just screwed up the correlation so much. And people just trade in and out of sectors and everything goes down at once and everything goes up at once. And so for us recently, it's been a great time to be picking stocks. I mean, we had our best quarter in the history of what we've been doing. 
Glad I could be a part of it. First of all, I love the fact that Danny's preaching to the choir here on the interest rates trading like a $100 million biotech. The bond market's broken. I think, well, we don't have to agree. Wait till you hear my rot later. I can't wait. But it's interesting, Vinny. You and I, baseball allegiances notwithstanding, we're very similar people. I know that intuitively from the first second we talked to each other. All three of you guys were well ahead of this energy trade. You were talking about energy before most of the country could spell energy. Now, all of a sudden, everybody's talking about it. I know in my brain, when everybody starts talking about it, I'm like, F it, I'm out. With that said, doesn't mean they're all wrong now. How do you marry that? Because I know in your emotional side of you wants to say, we got to get the hell out of this. The intellectual side of you says, we were early, everybody's on board, but we're still right. How do you deal with that? First off, I'm going to give Porter... A bit of credit here. He's been more steadfast. Not me. I have nothing to do with that energy. Trend. No, with regard to energy, my contrarian thoughts has been, it's no longer with the lone people saying this. That being said, the supply demand is great. However, we've evolved. When it comes to oil and gas, we've evolved. In many respects, if you think of, and the war was a major catalyst. So you pulled forward a lot of what is happening. Now, all of a sudden, because Europe is short oil and short energy, they need it. Well, how do they get it? Well, they're not getting it from Russia. So where is it coming from? Well, it's got to come from other sources, United States. Well, how the hell does it get from the United States to Europe? Well, it has to go on these ships. Really? Are there any ships that you could buy, stocks related, that own these ships that carry this stuff from? Well, yes, there might be some, Vincent. Yes, there is. You know, where do they trade? Oh, they trade at 30% of NAV. What? Yeah, they're left for dead. So we've been moving into the ships Rather than adding incremental dollars to the Chesapeake's, Chevron's, the Exxon's of the world, we've moved our money more to the things that are carrying this stuff, the things that are going to be processing natural gas overseas close to our shores. So that's how we evolved this trade. So we've evolved from the EMP solely to more of the picks and shovels or the things that get it from here to there. Vinnie and Porter pitched the Zim, Z-I-M, to me when it was at $14. And when they pitched it to me, you hear a pitch like that, you're like, that's too good to be true. They must have asbestos lawsuits or something on the ships. Like, there's no way. And Porter said to me at one point, he said, Danny, the dividend this year will be more than where the stock is trading right now. And Porter, what was the dividend that they just paid out? What was a dollar amount per share they just paid out about a month ago? They paid out a $17 dividend, which was greater than our cost base. They paid out a $17 dividend six months later from when he told me this thing was an orphan spin out shipping company that no one cared about. We did work on shippers together, like tankers and stuff. We had done some work because those are really specialty finance companies in the day. And they said this. I bought it. I sold it at 35, of course, on, from uh, 18 to 35 because why don't I like $80 a share with a $17 dividend? But anyway, I digress. My, my point is that this is exactly what I'm talking about. The opportunity set to be a stock picker. You think that Zim, when it spun out, wherever it spun out, was in any ETF, was in any passive or held by anybody? It was covered by two analysts. That's where you find your value. I'm just going to add on that. I'm going to be constructive. I, I want to try and be constructive. One of the things is to change what you're looking at and think about other places where you can make money. To me, that's probably the most constructive thing I could say. Porter said there were bull markets everywhere. There are. So that's where we've had our heads rather than looking at a software company that has gone from 40 times revenues to 30 times revenues and thinking it's an opportunity. It's not yet. Maybe one day it will be, but it's not. Do those ancillary plays, do they continue to work? Let's just say crude oil does not act well right now. I'm just telling you, like, if you look at that uptrend and you look at where we are with the war, the thing that made it break out above 100 and go straight to 130 and then back here to 100, if it goes to 90 and then maybe 85, and let's just say there's some sort of de-escalation in Eastern Europe, do all of those stories still work? Do we go back to a place where, I don't know, maybe we're just in a bit more of a peaceful world here and we move on? No one gave a shit about energy when it was like 4% of the S&P or something like that. And they're only giving a shit now because the stuff that are in the headlines and we're seeing all the volatility in the commodity, would you get the hell out of those things if it looked like there's not a bull case for crude above $100? Obviously, knee jerk, if Russia ends the war, the S&P is going a lot higher and, and crude's probably going a lot lower. But you talk about how crude's down a lot. Well, if you look out to the futures curve, the futures curve really hasn't moved at all. The December contract for crude is still $91. It was $91 beginning of March, and it's higher than the beginning of the war. So I don't think as much change. Spots move here and there, but futures curve is almost near its all-time highs. 
and natural gas is over six bucks and it's just ripping. And the equivalent in Europe is over a hundred. And so I'm not all that worried about it. These stocks are still high double digit free cash flow yields, a lot of them, the stuff that we own. And so look at Microsoft and other stocks like that. They're low single digit free cash flow yields. And I just don't worry about it and try to look out 12 months from now. And we're trying to maximize long-term gains as well. And so I don't really necessarily want to sell these just because I'm nervous in the near term. You just mentioned if the knee-jerk reaction, if Russia ends the war, is S&P much higher or stocks much higher? Where do they go? Do we get unchanged on the year in, in the S&P, which is down, what, 5.5% or something like that? I think we could get to unchanged maybe a little bit higher. But then after that... You think we have like a 3% up day on some big truce? Why not? Then after that, then we have to say, okay, what's next? Two things, right? And one we could talk about later. The Fed's coming, and they're probably coming even more than what they would be but for this war. The second thing, which I think is a little bit deeper, is I think the world's changed because of what happened. Everyone wants to go back to the last 13 years. I don't think that's going to happen. When the U.S. uses its power, I'm not saying whether they should or shouldn't have, and freezes reserves of a country, which has never been done before, to me, that changes practically everything. And we have to start thinking about a world that looks more like when we were younger, where you have two separate worlds, East and West. And I think there's a lot of opportunities in that. I know that sounds super bearish. I get it. But I actually think from a single stock perspective, there's so many different things to do. What it sounds like to me is super inflationary, by the way, because if we are back to that world, to your point, if peace breaks out tomorrow, which I don't think is going to happen, but that's neither here nor there. We'll go through a hypothetical. Inflation gets worse. Inflation theoretically gets worse because then the planet opens up again. The world opens up again. Economic activity. So the Fed is screwed either way, in my opinion, Danny. Well, maybe some of those things like wheat and maybe oil and those things come back in a little bit. But let me just say, it's a horrible situation and they've destroyed Ukraine. The country is literally dismantled. The infrastructure is completely broken and they're going to control the South and they're going to control the East. That's going to be the compromise. So I don't know how that's good for anybody. But to talk about portfolio management and being constructive when energy does. So if you're long a stock and you have a target and it goes up 100%, you're going to reduce your position because your position just doubled. You're not going to have 200% position at a twice the price unless something fundamentally has shifted. You can lie to yourself. If you're short a stock at 40 and it goes to 15, you're not increasing it back to a full position unless you think they're on the bankruptcy doorstep. So to answer your question, Dan, and to guide the whole behavioral finance aspect of being honest, every day is a new underwriting opportunity. I want to go back to for a second. Vinny, this morning, we're talking about he's getting constructive on this. I think they call it multipolar world these days and how it's East versus West. I go, okay, Vinny, get constructive. What do you want to buy? And he goes, this ticker LMT. I go, what's that? And he goes, Lockheed Martin. I go, what? Are you out of your mind? That is the most bearish thing you could possibly say. You think more defense spending and more wars is bullish? Yeah, but Porter, what I was going to say, we have had that in technology as it relates. Really, what you're talking about is China. And really, the next play is how China deals with Russia and Ukraine. And I think China looks at Ukraine and says, that's another opportunity for Belt and Road. I really do. Just like Danny likes calamity, I think the Chinese love the calamity. Go with that for a second, right? So let's say they say that. And my perspective is, okay, what does the U.S. do? And I'm just learning about this space. Are we going to send all of NVIDIA's chips and AMD's to Taiwan Semiconductor to be constructed there? The answer is no. So what do you buy on that? You buy Intel. They're spending $80 billion to build fabs in Arizona, in Ohio, in Europe, it's trading at 10 times earnings. It's going to be tough for the next two quarters because it is what it is. And look, I'm not bullish on the market, so I'm not jumping at it. And so when I mention this to people who know tech better than me, it's like, well, Vinny, it's dead. I go, Microsoft was dead 12 years ago. Vinny, I have a question. What? Is it inflationary to bring jobs back to the United States and build factories? I'm just throwing it out there. It is, but you're right. But I'm more bullish on the potential tangible CapEx cycle that might happen as a result of this war. I don't know how we pay for it. I don't. I don't know how you keep rates down while this happens. All I'm saying is we're going to need to do this stuff. We have deficits as far as the eye can see. Who cares? We had 15% deficits 2020, 12, 21. I don't know what's 22. Massive as well. I, I don't know who's going to pay for this as well. 
So, Vinny, it's interesting. Dan Nathan says this. So I understand what he's saying. He said, given our debt load, and I think right now U.S. debt to GDP is about 130 percent ish. Am I in the ballpark? I mean, it's approaching 150. Approaching 150. I think it's 20 to 21 trillion in GDP and 31 trillion in debt. Am I? Is that about right? Staggering numbers, right? And I interviewed Mike Novogratz in January, and he said, no developed economy has been able to get out of that kind of hole. Now, Dan will say, and I understand this, that by definition, rates can't go higher. My pushback is we better hope rates don't go higher. So what happens? They've moved meaningfully to Danny's earlier point. What happens if these continue higher? We can look towards the 1940s as what they might do, which is institute yield curve control. So you wouldn't be surprised that one of our largest investments that we have is gold. Because I think eventually the beauty of fiat that has worked for so long gets tested. And I think we're testing it right now. So as a result, I think if rates go too high or if the S&P goes down too much, here comes the Fed. They're going to have to cap yields. And then you could buy the crap out of gold. We just happen to own it right now. How do you own gold? Because I think for the audience, they'd be interested. I've said this. I'm not suggesting I'm right. This is just my view that under the set of circumstances you just outlined, if you own the GLD, you're in the absolute wrong instrument. Agreed. Porter, do you want to give our top long? The way we own it, PHYS is the sprot physical. They match it one for one. And then you own a lot of miners, a lot of gold, a lot of silver. And that's the way we're playing it. Wow. He didn't even go to the one I was thinking. So we own this ticker AMRK. They are a broker dealer. They're also vertically integrated and own a mint. They basically do what Goldman and Morgan Stanley and retail investors do, but their only product are precious metals, silver and gold. They also, in addition, just acquire JM Bullion, which trades directly with consumers, which are higher premium. The thing trades at like five times EBITDA. In addition to that, they just started a new product called Cyber Metals, which is going to have very similar qualities to the crypto community, unlike Crypto, though, it's going to be backed by gold, not by tether. So if you want to own something, because I hear it a lot. I hear, Vinny, how could you own gold? It doesn't yield anything, blah, 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 blah. Well, here you have a broker that is minting money, creating high ROEs, and trading at a low low multiple. Took 35 minutes to get to gold. That's fine. Second thing is, this company, correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm up at 3 in the morning, is this the 1-800-BUY-GOLD-NOW? Okay, it is, right? Sort of. JM Bullion is their direct. And by the way, if you buy gold at 3 in the morning, they will give it to you. But thank you for buying that gold because the premium you're going to pay, it, oh, it's gorgeous. It's 10%. First of all, maybe AMC, AMC bought a gold mine. Maybe AMC should have been buying this thing. They could, people could get movie tickets and gold delivered to the door at the same time. Guy. Reversion to the meme. Let's go at it. Because listen, look at GameStop. When they reported earnings, I think three weeks or so ago, it was a $70 stock. Where did it trade up to? I think it got up to 190 bucks or something. It's all happening right before our eyes again. What does that tell you, Danny Moses? Tells you, like I said, I'll know the market's corrected. One of the questions, which when Porter put out the tweet that they were going to be on today, one of the questions that came back was, how do you know when it's time or how do you know when this thing is washed? You know it's washed when stocks stop going up on splits that don't mean anything. You know it's over when stocks stop going up on someone purchasing 100,000 shares on top of 9 million just to make a statement. And so that's how I know it's over. So we were on this podcast last week, and I keep saying it. And I don't own, I've never owned those stocks, right, AMC or GameStop. I have been short them at various times. But to me, there's layups that are, things are handed to you. Could GameStop have gone from 190 to 300? Why not 400, 500? Things that don't trade on fundamentals don't have a top, right? Because they can go anywhere they want. But to me, to watch this happen over and over and over again, we are now at the point, I used to joke that with AMC at 20 bucks or 19, wherever it is, there are people in the last six months that have lost $80 on it. They've lost $80 trading it from short, long, short, anything you want to be. Chasing, what do you mean, Dan? I don't, what is your- my, What's what my is, obsession? Because yeah. it's my barometer. It is my, you want to tell me you want, that's what I'm watching. I'm watching that Oh, stuff. I think there's so many things so much more important Okay, in single stock land. I mean, I want to look at Square that rallied 60%. When it was down 65%, rallied 60%, but still down 50%. You can do that math. When that goes through the lows, okay, and it will go back through those lows. I mean, there's there's like dozens of other things that I find more impactful. Those are a sideshow, and I, I took them off my main board. Dan, yeah, you're making a mistake, and here's why. Why? What you're talking about, and I don't disagree with you, the NVIDIAs and the Squares of the world, those are institutionally held. That's where institutions are hiding, meaning they're not in AMC and GameStop institutions. They're not. No smart institution is in those names. They're not in the long side. 
the only people that would be in are credit people that have some type of hedge going on. What has driven this market to these levels? What has been the incremental, has been retail. Yeah, but they're done, dude. They're not done, Dan. What because are you talking about? There's like 100 stocks that are down 70% from their highs that were the top stocks that retail was trading in early 01. And you were trading dot-com with me, right? You I mean, not together, but you were in the market there. We saw what happened. We saw JDS Uniphase. Vinny and I were working together at Oppenheimer. We had Henry Blodgett as our analyst. We had Jim Jungjahan. You can see, we see where these bodies were buried that own these stocks. There was these advanced photonics out of Canada, API. There was these stocks that we would see. Those were made for retail. My point, Dan, is that I'm actually upset to watch it because I hate to see people continuously. Why do you care? Those people, I care. they love it. I actually think it's their entertainment. They're tweeting about it. They're on Discord. They're having fun with it the way you spend money doing whatever the hell it is that you do as your hobby. I just don't think it's a real barometer. Dan, when I was on this John Stewart thing. I had access to these retail guys and they take it seriously. They believe I, I met these people. I talked to them. I've had conference calls with them. They talk themselves into something that they part of a movement. They don't think it's funny. They actually believe it's them against everybody else. And my point is that I don't view the stock market that way. I try to be objective. I know you can't tell from how I'm talking right now that I don't get emotional about it. At the same time, I want to help people. I don't know. There's something in me that wants to help. Vinny, do those people want to be helped? Well, first off, could I defend the retail people? Yeah, and I know they've had a hard time lately. They kicked the living shit out of us in Tesla. But Dan, I agree with you. It's a sideshow. And it's actually a fun sideshow to watch, but I don't think it's as meaningful to me. You agree, though, that like CrowdStrike and Zoom and that stuff is a lot more important. That leads to something else, those names, which is the hedge fund community, which does own them. And all of the VC private equity stuff that they own that is based and predicated on the valuations of those things and going public. If that doesn't work, there is significant more downside in tech as a result. And where I think the most mismarked assets are, are in the private VC. And we know there's like a six to nine month lag from public to private. And that's kind of my point is keep an eye on those recent lows and some of the things that a lot of VCs and private equity are using as public comps right now because they have not been marked down enough. You saw that Instacart markdown based on the DoorDash. There's more coming. It's all over the place. And then what do some of these crossover funds have to do if they're finally going to take the marks in their private sector? They sell the things that they can to raise cash if they have redemptions. Now, VCs don't have redemptions in that way, and they're raising a shit ton of capital right now. Everybody I know who's a VC, at least raising right now or just closed to raise. So SoftBank is the worst example of, if you want to call it PE or whatever you want to call what he's built there. They already were exposed, right? More than anybody else. Cards were on the table. We work. Disaster. Shutting down their hedge fund that was buying all those call options, whatever. That's out there. We've seen what can happen when they get exposed. There are several marks, Vinny, to your point, that are coming. I want to send it to Porter. This is near and dear to our hearts. You could talk about SoFi and what just happened yesterday, if you want to touch on that. First of all, I talk about what's the sign and talking about CrowdStrike and Zoom and stuff like that. Those are real companies, though. Real companies are like a Home Depot. Real companies are a better barometer of what the economy is doing. We were going there, though, Porter, just really based on what Danny was saying about the meme stocks and what it means for retail investor sentiment. I always go back with Drux says. Drux says, always look at the internals of the markets. So what does it say to you, though, Home Depot 400 to 300 in a few months? That's the most bearish thing. The stock was 200 before COVID. So we keep on talking about how rates are up a lot and stuff like that. But before oil spiked and everyone's talking about how do you lap COVID. And so I think we're still trying to figure out how much does inflation matter and how much did we pull forward before COVID? And so I think we're going through all this stuff, trying to figure out where the bottom is. I just doesn't feel like the bottom is close. That's just my opinion. So a few minutes ago, Danny Moses said, we went 35 minutes before we mentioned gold. Well, we're now 43 minutes before we talked about Tesla. Now, Danny, take a breath, okay? Because I know you got a lot to say here. Vinny, I'm going to ask you. I know Tesla is a four-letter word for a lot of people, myself included. You've seen what's happened over the last couple of weeks, the stake in Twitter, subsequent board seat. Tesla stock, trillion-dollar market cap company, went from $700 a share to north of $1,100. It rallied over 50% in less than, what, two weeks? First of all, in terms of the stock market, I mean, that's just an unhealthy market. But in terms of Musk, Tesla, what's been going on? What are your thoughts, Vinny? Can I go pop culture on you right now? F and A, man. So I have an affinity for old school Steven Seagal. If you think about his characters and Above the Law, Nico Toscani. Anybody see Richie? Anybody know why Richie did Bobby Lupo? Mason Storm and Hard to Kill. 
Gino Fellino in Above the Law, that's the Everybody See Richie. He was the guy that always went against the person who can't be taken down. We need a Steven Seagal in government. Think about all the things he's done and, and give him credit for what he's built. But everything about him is he's above the law. I just wish someone in government would call him out. It's as if they're afraid of him. I'm curious as to why is he bulletproof? Is just great intellect, is that sort of the Teflon for everything? Or is it just nobody's been willing to take him on? No one's willing to take him on. And I, this is my guess. My gut tells me the people underneath that work for the SEC, not the heads, they probably would love to take him on seeing what they're doing. He's making a mockery of all of our stuff, but they're not allowed to. They're not going to touch him, guys. You know, like the SEC doesn't do anything. If they actually take down Barry Diller, I'll be, I'll be shocked. That whole thing, it just reeks to high hell. I mean, that's another conversation probably for another podcast. But let me throw this one out just because. Where do they go to that place in Switzerland, Dan? You've probably been where all the high faluters go. Davos? Well, it was a couple of years ago at the Davos, and Joe Kernan was interviewing then-President Trump. And they were playing name association. And I'll never forget this. Joe Kernan, seemingly out of nowhere, was just throwing things out. Then he said, Elon Musk. The stock at the time, I think, was under a significant amount of pressure, trading $300 or so, obviously pre-split. And then President Trump said, Tesla, Elon Musk, one of the great geniuses, like Thomas Edison. Then he said, like the guy that invented the wheel. And I'm like, oh, my God. But then he said something that really resonated with me. He said, you know, they were in a lot of trouble, but we helped them out, and now they're going to help us out. And I will tell you, and I said it on the show that week, from that point on, Tesla's been untouchable. Thoughts? You're 100 percent right. And I remember that day vividly. And I remember either talking to Vinny or Porter that day. I'm like, something's changed here. Something's wrong. Of course, I stayed short and probably kept doing it anyway, because that's always my weakness, fundamentals. But there was something else. The reason even prior to that, when Tesla bought Solar City, we had been short Solar City just puts in our fund. We convinced ourselves it was a finance company, which it really was because they financed solar roofs. And we even made money, even went from 44 to 12 or 14. And then Musk comes in and buys it goes to 26, 28 bucks, whatever. And so that was my first iteration of even paying attention, honestly, to Elon Musk or Tesla. I didn't even care. Then I said, this is the most obvious fraud I've ever seen in my career. He had a margin call. He owned this much Solar City. His cousins run it. Meanwhile, that thing's still going on five years later, whenever this thing is going on, and his, the presentation in Universal Studios with the fake solar roof and the whole thing. I'm like, what am I watching here? And it really comes down for me is this. Yes, there's an obsession with it. But because I'm such a believer in capital markets, because I am such a believer in efficiency, because I want things to work like they should, if you're on the 10-yard line going in, unless you're the Jets and you're really you're going to fumble, and all of a sudden, instead of having 10 yards to go, you have 90 to go. You flip the field on you. I feel like the field just gets flipped sometimes on this stuff. And so, and I've even said it myself, it's an obsessment, not an investment, right? And that's bad. And to the point that Porter and Vinny made earlier, and I've said this many times, and we had a conversation about this the other day. The opportunity cost of dealing with a Tesla, you could have three longs and three shorts and have six companies that you can get right. And if you're spending all your time on this mad scientist, then you're wasting your time. You're wasting brain cells because you could use that for something else. So anyway. In the movie that called us the angriest hedge fund in America, we get pissed off about this stuff all the time. I mean, there was this article about Morgan Stanley and block trading, and they were giving special deals to some guy. It just never ends. And if you don't have a watchdog or policeman policing any of this stuff, it's not capitalism anymore. And that's the stuff that frustrates us the most, right? Is that you just want efficient, fair markets where everyone can play. And I think retail feels that. I mean, that's part of the why I sympathize with some of these retail guys in AMC and GameStop is that they just want fair markets. They were shut out during the fiasco last year. But there's a real anger out there. And we're angry every day about it because... Morgan Stanley probably should have been barred from IPO business for doing what it's doing, but it's not. Nothing's going to happen. The shareholders are going to take the hit because they're passive shareholders. There's no one voting, and it feels like a lot of parts are broken. But think about this, Porter. This started, we started talking about retail and sentiment, and Vinny brought up Tesla. Hundreds of billions of dollars have been made for retail investors. So the form of capitalism that you're railing against, that you think is broken, there's a lot of people benefiting from it. playing devil's advocate in a way. And there's been nobody able to basically prove that there's been any impropriety. What do you mean? He's paid fines for improprieties. So, But my point is he has a trillion dollar market cap stock. Mazel. SpaceX is worth $100 billion. 
Speaking of bad marks, yeah. You think that's a bad mark? No, I don't. SpaceX is going to be a trillion around. dollar market cap company. And then let's be clear, timestamp that. Okay. The TAM is, it's infinite. Infinite. Like space itself. Space itself. And so there's a whole new set of retail investors who are long Tesla and don't give a shit about AMC and GameStop. I'll counter that before Vinny answers. What if you wake up one day and it won't happen? He actually gets arrested or something yeah. really powerful, yeah. the DOJ, and the stock goes from 1,000 to 300. Okay, let's just say that that happens. There's key man risk. If he gets hit by a bus tomorrow, and I'm not wishing it on him, the stock's down $300 like that. We agree. Well, it's not 1000 but yeah. We short sell, so we're frustrated all the time. But mostly it's rigged for the market to go higher. And so not having a watchdog on anything is fine because it allows stocks to go higher. And the Fed got themselves in the same predicament. They didn't police the banks in 3 or 4 or 5 or 6. And it led to a big problem. And so the same thing happened with the Fed again, whereas they weren't paying attention to inflation, weren't paying attention to inflation, pumping $120 billion a month in, and all of a sudden we have inflation and then you got a problem. And so that's our biggest frustration is that there's no prudence on the part of anybody, Fed, whether the SEC, whether it's the climate activists, there's no prudence, there's no rational person actually thinking through steps And I think that's what frustrates us the most and why we're still angry as hedge fund in America. So I know Vinny and Porter know this. I know Dan and I know this, but Danny is exercised all the time. But we needed to carve out a segment where he is particularly exercised. And we decided to call it a rut or rip off the tape. Well, today you're exercised about things that are a little arcane and a lot of people might not be familiar with, but it's extraordinarily important. So, Danny Moses, without further ado, a French word, please. Yeah, so I talked about this. I believe I mentioned it on the podcast, but I didn't rot on it. And I'm glad Vinny and Porter are here to talk about this because one of the risks with the Fed and the runaway inflation and losing control is what's going to happen in your favorite market, Guy, Treasury repo market, what might happen? Well, part of Wall Street's fixing machine and no one goes to jail. Actually, someone went, the people did actually go to jail from the LIBOR fixing scandal that went on is financial markets are transitioning from LIBOR to SOFR, secured overnight financing rate. That SOFR, without getting too wonky, is based on the Treasury repo market. And it's actually backwards looking versus what LIBOR, which was fixed, but was forwards looking. So in September of 2019, when the repo market went haywire and Treasury repo market was trading at 10%, imagine if that were to happen now. So how's the plumbing doing right now within the system? We see how Treasury bonds are trading. So you're telling me the Fed's gonna pull all this liquidity. So right now in the mail, you're getting mailers or emails which say on your credit card at the bottom, we will be transitioning from LIBOR to SOFR. If you're signing a new contract right now for a home that's going to be floating or anything, it's going to say SOFR on it. And you mark my words right now, there will be chaos in that market as we transition. Somehow, Wall Street will find a way many to make money on it, but you guys need to watch this. So just go look at what happened in the repo market in September 2019, right? It spoke to 10%. By the way, the repo market typically trades in line with Fed funds. At that time, Fed funds were 2 to 2.5% two somewhere in there. So keep an eye on that. And I don't know what you guys think, Vinny Porter, because it has a huge implication on credit markets. So I remember being on Fast Money that night, and I said, something just happened in the repo market, and people looked at me like a nine heads. I'm telling you right now, I get COVID happened in March, April. I understand in subsequent year. But that set the tone for that market sell-off. I'm convinced that the blow up in that market, the overnight repo market was it. Now you're seeing, by the way, the exact opposite's been going on for the last six months. And now you're talking so for LIBOR, this is gonna be a problem. Vinny. So the way I think about it, I try to keep it simple. Here's the one constant that doesn't go away. Our country runs fiscal deficits. Someone needs to buy that stuff. And someone needs to buy that stuff at a yield that makes sense for them. There are reasons why foreign central banks and all that will buy it. But nevertheless, we just took out the one of the largest buyers. However, I would also say what also happened in the treasury market and every other credit fixed income market was the yield didn't work for them. So how did they fix that? They levered themselves 10 to 1, 15 to 1, 20 to 1, 30 to 1. And so I actually think the repo market is a function of how much leverage and the repo scare was how much leverage that was there And one of the counterparties, J.P. Morgan, didn't want to fund it. The problem is, is I think we need rates to go higher to get people to buy this stuff. But to Dan's point, I don't think they can because we have too much debt. It's a bit of a conundrum. I don't know how we solve this thing, right? And if you layer on top a little confusion with variable rates, 
it could be an issue, no doubt about it. SOFR is supposed to be, you know, the risk-free rate. Basically, there's no credit risk. I just think something's going to happen, and we'll see what happens. Is there a way to trade that? I mean, you've been talking about all these financing companies. I mean, you pointed out Carvana before. Again, anybody ever heard of Carvana? In your mind, can you start to connect the dots and say, right, there's a way to either get long stock on the back of this or to be short a stock on the back of this? We're seeing widening in credit spreads right now, and Vinny and Porter can talk to this, but just in the securitization market, spreads versus two-year, which is the most important, are widening. So what investors are requiring to buy that paper that's being produced by these platforms is they want a higher margin. They want higher coupon, and that has reverberations back. So something like this only adds to that volatility. If something like this were to actually happen and we had a crazy in the repo market again that's based on treasuries, that would have a reverberation. It would shut down at least, I mean, shut down is probably too strong a word, but it would people would take a deep breath and figure out what that means. People ask me, what do they have up on their screen? I say, listen, you put whatever you want. You have to have HYG, High Yield Bond ETF, Vinny. And that thing doesn't trade. But go back 20 years or so, it's had huge moves to the downside that have been a precursor to an equity move. This thing was 88 bucks forever, traded below 80 recently, and is rolling over. Am I nuts to be looking at that? No, you're not nuts, but you probably want to go a little bit further. So you want to look at five-year CDS spreads as a notional. And the other thing is, I think you want to parse and break the HYG into its components because a significant component of the HYG are fixed income related to oil and gas companies. And I could tell you those are tightening because they're paying down their cash flows. I would look to other companies where if we're starting to see credit deterioration, sell. So. So, Porter, the flip side of that is price discovery. We all talk about price discovery. Well, guess what? One of the many either intended consequences or unintended consequences of the Fed is they've obliterated price discovery. And HYG, I think, probably one of the things that they have on their balance sheet, if you were to look. Speak to me about that. How does that play itself out? And now maybe we're finally going to get true price discovery. I would agree with you on the HYG. One of the things this guy... Zoltan Pozar put out a paper, one of the top five plumbing dorks on planet Earth. He put this paper out, which I understood less than 1% of. But the basic message was is that the Fed can print dollars, but they can't print oil or they can't print commodities. And so he's thinking about a new Bretton Woods 3 or a new role of the dollar. But the point I'm making about the Danny and the SOFA and the price discovery and the HYG, what the Fed can do is they can print. And when the printing press is taken away, it's a real problem. And I think the inflation has pulled the printing press from the Fed. And whether it's HYG widening or the ability to fix small problems is gone. And so I think when you find the bottom of the market is when the Fed is finally on the front foot. I think they're in outer space right now. They don't even know what's going on because they are so far behind the curve. And they know if they hike aggressively, they're hiking into a slowing economy and it's just a mess right now. And so that's why Benny and I are pretty scared about what's going on right now. So our listeners heard that Vinny and Porter were with us. We have got a treasure trove of questions. When we come back, we're going to effort to answer a few. With CME Group Micro Futures and Options, you can get the same access and capital efficiencies of the standard contracts with less upfront financial commitment. Diversify your portfolio and add flexibility by trading CME Group micro contracts in crypto, precious metals, FX, energy, and equity indices. Learn more about what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com slash micros. Hey, Dan. What up, guy? You're into this fintech. What's all this I'm hearing about Current? You're going to like this guy. Current is a fintech company that's completely disrupting traditional banking. Wait a second. Does that mean I don't have to drive to the bank anymore? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm a new Current customer, and I manage all of my finances from one easy-to-use app. Well, I got to get this app, but where can I learn more? It's super easy. Just go to Current.com slash tape and download the app. That's Current.com slash tape. Current is a financial technology company, not a bank. Banking services provided by and Visa debit card issued by Choice Financial Group, member FDIC, pursuant to a license from Visa USA Inc. and can be used everywhere Visa debit cards are accepted. Hey, it's Dan here. I'm excited to tell you about a $1 billion app that's disrupting the way people like you and me invest. It's called Masterworks. They offer investors access to an estimated $1.7 trillion alternative asset that was once only accessible by the ultra-wealthy. I'm talking about blue chip art. 
Blue Chip Art has seen price appreciation that's outpaced the S&P 500 by 164% from 1995 to 2021. And the Wall Street Journal recently called it among the hottest markets on earth. It's no wonder the ultra-rich like Jeff Bezos recently sold tons of Amazon stock and bought more art. And now you can too with the art investment app called Masterworks.io. Join over 300,000 members for free on Masterworks.io. Just go to Masterworks.art slash tape. That's masterworks.art slash tape. See important disclosures at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. Taboola uses AI to power recommendations for many of the world's top publishers and cell phone manufacturers. You know Taboola. If you ever went to websites like CNBC or USA Today, when you finish reading an article, it's that tricked out recommendation engine pointing you towards additional content you will like. They also help brands reach over 500 million daily users, which makes them a compelling alternative to Facebook and Google ad platforms. Taboola has long-term exclusive partnerships with publishers, which means they help people like you and me discover content outside of social media. Taboola is a founder-led company that is traded as TBLA on the NASDAQ. Find out more about their mission at taboola.com. So Porter and Vinny, at the beginning of the podcast, you talked about, you both talked about how, again, stock pickers market, you hear that all the time, but it's true more so now than ever. And one of the viewers is asking that exactly that. If we're in a bear market, how do you maneuver through it? And how do you pick stocks? Because as you both know, Vinny, I'll start with you. Some of the most violent rallies take place in bear markets. The first thing you have to do is you can't get too greedy, particularly on the bearish side. So if a stock goes down 20, 30 percent and the relative strength indices and everything else is signaling that it's just way too low, you got to cover some. You have to. You can't expect that you're going to make all your money in a bear market it comes and we just had one of the more vicious rallies. On the other side of the equation, on the long side, you really better get your fundamentals correct, better than correct. Because as we've learned in bear markets, true bear markets, everything goes down. And I don't think we're truly in a super bear market yet because things are still going up. Danny, this is for you. I'm teeing you up with it. To what extent is the Federal Reserve trapped? We address that. And what can the possible implications of a policy error if it over tightens. Hold on a second. I think everybody thinks it's an error to start tightening. They already made their policy errors for the last 13 years. Thoughts, Danny Moses? They will err. They will tighten too much, in my opinion. I will say this. I didn't think inflation would get this hot. Was not a transitory person, but this is much hotter than I thought. That being said, they're trying to gain any shred of credibility that they can. I will say, from an equity market perspective, they have gotten the CME Fed Fund futures to where they want them. But again, I don't think the market is pricing in what that actually means as an input, like we just talked about before. So the answer is, yes, they'll make an error. And I think what's going to happen is, and Vinny, I don't know how you still feel about this, or Porter, I was still in the camp of three to four hikes and done. We'll be at three, technically. We'll be at 75 base points of hikes in about three weeks, four weeks from now. And whether there's something happens in that gap, yeah, they're going 50. I'm assuming they're going 50. If they don't go 50, something has happened. I do think that things will come back down to earth a little bit. But the policy era, in my opinion, is going to be qualitative tightening. And I'm still a believer that when they start doing this, run off of the mortgage-backed securities, which Peter Bookvar had a great comment in the Wall Street Journal on, it's going to be hard because refis are going so slow that the runoff is going to take longer, things like that. They're going to screw this whole thing up. So the answer, in a nutshell, is they continuously make errors. They will continue to make errors on the way out. And so I have no confidence that they have any control of what's going on. There are terms in markets I can't stand. One, cash on the sidelines. In golf, they talk about it's a ball striker's course. What golf course isn't a ball striker's course? Policy error is the other one. What constitutes a policy error? I hate to make it on financial media. They're going to call it a policy error. It's not a policy error yet because markets haven't really gone down. But the minute markets go down, it's a policy error. Like you said, Guy, the policy error happened a long, long, long time time ago. Another question. This is from Larry Linville. Now, it can't be that Larry Linville, but I'm just reading the question here. A few weeks ago, I heard Guy ask a question of Gavin Baker, and he said that he was watching TV and he saw a commercial for the Great Wolf Lodge. Not to go to the Great Wolf Lodge, but they were trying to get people to work at the Great Wolf Lodge. So, Danny Moses, you just said inflation, you didn't think we'd get this high and it's going to... 
you think about when you have now advertisements on television to get workers to our viewers or listeners question, that is the last piece of the inflation puzzle. Thoughts? We are at 3.6% unemployment. The all-time low is 3.4%. So it's hard to see that getting, but with that are come wage gains and so forth, which are going to be inflationary and sticky. And the only way to get rid of that is to lay people off, not to cut their wages. So that's where the stagflation part comes in. It's healthy. The unemployment rate's super low. This is great news for the U.S. economy because the real workers are getting a real wage. They've been stiffed for years. They didn't hike minimum wage fast enough for, for long enough. And so you said that they didn't hike Amazon. There's been a lot of companies who've been paying. Guys, I'm just going to tell you this, and, and you guys are all much smarter than me. Prior to the pandemic, we were talking about universal basic income. We were talking about automation. We talked about that fab that Intel or the fabs at Intel. You know who makes those chips? Machines. I'm not so worried this wage price spike that we've seen. It's really at the low end. And these were jobs that were going to be automated away anyway. There were two things that happened last week that amazingly financial media didn't pick up on. Starbucks, Seattle, unionization. Amazon, Staten Island, unionization. To ignore maybe the long-term implications of what's happening with wages. I agree with you, Dan. Automation's a big trend. But I actually think wage inflation relative to other goods inflation, they've been in a figure four leg lock, the workers, for the past 40 years. And I think there's a higher possibility that that might change. And that's what I'm trying to pay attention to. I mean, just look at housing. They've been shut out for a long time, right? It's the high end buying two, three houses and the low end. They've been priced out for a long time. What's changed in the last 10 years to think that Americans want to do those jobs? Danny, you and I were at a bar last night. We were talking to a friend of ours whose kid is at uh, Wisconsin, and his kid is from a town that's in Wisconsin that's filled with Somalis. You know why it's filled with Somalis? Because there's a chicken processing plant nearby. And the Somalis will do the work that the local Wisconsin's don't want to do, which is cracking heads off chickens and stuff like that. I'm just not convinced that's going to be a thing here in America. You're making a great case for an intelligent immigration system. No doubt. This is what our country has been built upon, intelligent immigration. And so I think that if current U.S. citizens don't want to do these jobs, import them, bring them in. That's the best solution. Technology is the greatest deflationary force in the history of mankind, to Dan's point. And you're right. On the low end, that's where we're seeing this. But you know what? It's not just on the low end anymore. Look at these investment banks. They have to pay up to get talent. So it's happening all across the spectrum. And oh, by the way, before we get to Danny Moses's master's picks, real wages in this country are still negative. You got a long way to go before you see the wage growth that I think you're going to see. You guys see, Wolf, you guys have a very detailed quarterly letter, and I know we read it and hopefully some of our listeners read it here. It did seem like the bear cave. I think, Porter, you tend to be a bit more constructive about some things than maybe some of the rest of us here. Guy and I are just guys who kind of yap about this stuff on podcasts and on TV and stuff like that. How can we be wrong that we're about to face some sort of multi-year calamity as it relates to all sorts of central bank policy errors, a realignment of the geopolitical environment, which causes a whole host of those sorts of things, runaway inflation? What could go right here, I guess? We talked a little bit about it, but a lot of the U.S. corporations are in very good shape. The balance sheets are very good. The consumer balance sheets are very good. The big concern I have is on the sovereign balance sheet, and tears tell me I shouldn't be worried about that. So maybe just this is a little bit of, of gas inflation, and, and the economy will power right through it. That might be the case. And so I think that's the bull case. And on an inflation-adjusted basis, $100 oil is not really that high. Rates on a relative basis are still only you know 2.5% on the 10-year basis. And so that's the bull case. And a lot of these companies produce a lot in earnings and will buy back stock, and that's the way it works, and move along. And so that, that's the bull case. It would be hard to imagine, but let's go there. I mean, we're talking about better government policy. That's really what we're talking about. Better immigration policy, as Porter mentioned better energy policy, a significantly change of where you take climate into account, but you also take into account energy security. Somehow, some way, we need a significantly middle-of-the-road president at some point. We need better tax policy. All those things would be extremely constructive for this country. And these are big things, and I know the probability is low, but this would get me significantly more constructive. And somehow, some way, as a result of that, 
the inflation, while it will probably be higher than what it has been for the past 40 years, will be tolerable at a reasonable level. Now the moment that most people tune in, they didn't want to hear me talk. I mean, that's for shit sure. They came because, as both of you guys know, having sat next to him for years, when he's hot, I mean, he is white effing hot. And he has been white effing hot ever since the start of the NFL season. Well, when this podcast drops at your favorite podcast store, it'll be day two of the Masters on Friday. Danny Moses. So I tweeted out yesterday because I just wanted to get on the record so you can see that my topic was Cam Smith, who is currently six under through 16. And by the way, double bogeyed the first hole. So he is eight under on the next 15 holes that he played. Tiger Woods is one under through 16. It's just amazing. So I do like, obviously, Cam Smith. I do like Cantlay, which I mentioned at 20 to 1. He's even right now through six in real time on the first round. Sam Burns, who's first time playing, as Ned pointed out to my tweet to give me a pointer that that's probably a bad pick, but... 33 to 1, he's been hot. I took him. He's plus two through seven. And I threw in a bulldog just because you got to pick a bulldog because they went everywhere. I took Kisner at 100 to 1. But Cam Smith has been my big pick. I have him in a pool. I have him in this. So, like Cam Smith here, let me just wrap up the NCAA Final Four. So, I had Carolina winning outright, but they did cover in the final. And I'm a schmuck for many reasons, but specifically because I had them both at 20 to 1, the Sweet 16, and 70 to 1 when the tournament started. And when they were up 16, I did not hedge with Kansas, and I always do. I could have had plus 400 at that point. I mean, who does something like you that? You do. You are James Kahn in the movie The Gambler when he gets 18 and he hits on an 18 and he gets a three because that's what you want to do because you want to have that moment where you can just walk away. That's why you didn't do it. Schmuck on wheels is what that was. So anyway, that's my pick. It's going to be a great weekend. The fact that Tiger looks like he'll probably make the cut. In the history of sports globally, I don't know if there'll ever be anything like this in our lifetime. I mean, he hadn't played for, what, 17 months or something? He comes back. This guy is just incredible. Anyway, so really enjoyed having you guys on here. We're going to get J.P. Morgan quarter next week. It's going to tell us a lot. I, mean, I know we didn't talk about it this week, but Jamie Dimon's letter is always a great read. He put it out over the weekend or late, late Friday, I believe. Definitely people should read it out there, and we'll see. But like I said before, I think the volatility lies ahead, obviously, in this quarter. So. Porter, Vinny, thanks so much for being here. We'd love having you. You will clearly be back. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks once again to CME Group for sponsoring this episode of On the Tape. If you liked what you heard, make sure you hit follow and leave us a review. It helps people find our show, and we love hearing from you. And we also want to hear from you via email at onthetape at riskreversal.com any time of the day. Follow and connect with us on Twitter at On The Tape Pod, and we'll see you next time. On The Tape is a risk reversal media production. This podcast is for informational purposes only. All opinions expressed by me, Dan Nathan, Guy Adami, Danny Moses, and any other participants are solely our opinions and should not be relied upon for specific investment decisions. (laughs) 